So let's start. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody to the third meeting of the seminar of Metaphysics of Science. It's my pleasure to introduce Peter Thiessen from the Université Catholique de Louvain. Uh, the title of the presentation is Conventionality and Reality. Peter, as you know, you have one hour roughly, and then we can take a five minutes break and then uh, discussion. So, whatever you want, Peter. Yep. Thanks, Christian. Uh, I would say it's a pleasure to be here, but I'm at home. <laughs> so, uh, it's a pleasure seeing you virtually and giving this talk. Um, if, if, if there would be any urgent questions, feel free to just jump in because I can't see the chat. So uh, just switch on your mic and, uh, and feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so, so my talk for today is, um, is based on a, on a paper I, I wrote for a special issue of the Foundations of Physics uh, with Carlo Rovelli and, and Benyami, uh, which was called Conventionality and Reality. Um, see my cue. Yeah. So there, there have been two debates in the philosophy of special relativity. First one is the debate on the conventionality of simultaneity, and the second one is the debate on the reality of space-time, um, or you could say the, the dimensionality of the world. Now, the first debate was sparked by Albert Einstein in 1905 when he, uh, when he claimed that the notion of, of distant simultaneity uh, really is a conventional notion as opposed to a factual one. And the latter debate was initiated by Minkowski in 1908 when he claimed that the world, according to special relativity, is fundamentally four-dimensional. Uh, now, an important contribution to this letter debate in favor of Minkowski's claim was uh, an argument that was developed by Ritek and Putnam, uh, which is now known as the Ritek-Putnam argument uh, for the four-dimensionality of the world. Um, but it has to be said that, that 100 years uh, later, uh, both debates uh, remain unresolved. Yeah, um, the, there haven't been any clear-cut answers to any of those two debates. Uh, but what is perhaps most interesting is that the link between those two debates has rarely been explored. Now, what I want to do in this talk is to, is to look at how these two debates are related to one another, uh, and in particular how the conventionality thesis impacts the Ritek putnam argument for the four-dimensionality of the world. Now, I could only find three relatively obscure little papers um, that actually explored this relationship. Uh, one was a paper by Weingart, one by Sklar, and one by Deeks. And it seems that they all uh, reached the same conclusion, namely that the conventionality thesis would undermine the Ritek putnam argument. And so what I want to do today is to question this conclusion and show you that the situation is actually much more subtle than that. Now, I didn't want to assume too much prior knowledge in special relativity, and so I decided to actually spend quite some time introducing those two debates, spending some time introducing the necessary concepts, um, which I will do in the first three parts, um, and only in the last part will I actually look at the relationship between those two debates. But so let me start by introducing you to the first debate, which is the debate on the conventionality of simultaneity. So the idea that simultaneity is a conventional notion already originated in some of the writings of Henri Poincaré. Uh, and as I just said in the 1905 paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies by Albert Einstein. Now, this conventionality thesis was then further developed by Hans Reichenbach in the 1920s uh, and by uh, Grunbaum in the 1950s. So in order to introduce this debate, um, just imagine two distant events, uh, one event at location A, another event at location B. Now to say that those two events uh, are simultaneous with one another is actually just to say that they occur at the same time. 
So in other words, if you were to place a green clock at location A to measure the time of occurrence of event A, and a blue clock at location B to measure the time of occurrence of event B, you would notice that both clocks are indicating the same time. Yeah, that is, if TA equals TB, you can maintain that both events are simultaneous with one another. But of course, in order to do so, you first need to ensure that your two clocks have been previously synchronized. Uh, if your blue clock is still indicating summertime and not winter time, obviously you won't reach the right conclusions. And so this leads to the question, how should one actually synchronize distant clocks in special relativity? Now Einstein proposed a clock synchronization procedure in his 1905 paper, which is now known as standard synchrony. Um, and the way to synchronize these distant clocks is actually very simple. It only involves a beam of light that travels from A to B and back to A. Now in his paper, Einstein also wrote that we will establish by definition that the time required by light to travel from A to B equals the time it requires to travel back from B to A. To a. That is the speed of light here is taken to be a constant. Now, if I were to, to draw this synchronization procedure on a Minkowski diagram, it would look something like, uh, like this. So on a Minkowski space-time diagram, time is running upwards vertically, um, space is, is, is represented uh, horizontally. So what you see here is the world line of the first clock at A, the green clock. Clearly, it's, it's only vertical, so it's not moving in space. It's only moving in time. You see time evolving from zero to four. Um, and a certain distance away, you have the second clock, the B clock, um, where I haven't indicated any times as of yet because we're in the process of synchronizing this clock with the green clock. And now Einstein says what you need to do is to send a light beam from A to B. Uh, let's say it leaves the green clock at time TA and it arrives at B at time TB. And then you immediately send that light beam back from B to A. And so it comes back to the green clock at time TA prime. Then since the speed of light is a constant, since it takes equal, an equal amount of time to go from A to B as, to B for, uh, as from B to A, uh, obviously TA prime minus TB will equal TB minus TA. And now we can rewrite that expression in terms of TB because that's the value we're looking uh, and you get the following expression. Uh, and so if now you would actually fill in the numbers as indicated here, TA equals zero, TA prime equals four. So you get four divided by two. So uh, TB occurs at two o'clock. And with that, I've actually successfully synchronized my two distant clocks. Uh, and of course, once I've done that, what I can do is, is connect the events, the distant events that happen at the same time, the events that are simultaneous with one another uh, as follows. And what you see is that this imposes a foliation of Minkowski space-time into three-dimensional hyperplanes of simultaneity. Yeah, those those represent, represent moments of time. Um, now with the synchronization uh, procedure, it's actually very simple to show the relativity of simultaneity, not the conventionality, but the relativity. So if I, would, if I were to apply the same synchronization procedure, but to moving clocks, yeah, here are two clocks that are moving to the right, uh, I again send a light beam from C to D and back to C. Um, you can see that, um, that the time TD is again equal to two. I've synchronized my clock and now I again connect the events that are simultaneous with one another, you will see that the hyperplanes of simultaneity are no longer horizontal, but actually have been slanted as a consequence of the fact that those clocks are moving with respect to the green and the blue clock. And that is known as the relativity of simultaneity. So here again, you see two observers, observer A and observer B. Observer A is standing still. Observer B is moving to the right relative to observer A. And due to their relative motion, they will draw their hyperplanes of simultaneity differently, horizontally for A, slanted for B, and so they will disagree on what events are simultaneous with the here and now uh, at point O. So for observer A, it's the event P and Q that are simultaneous with O, but for observer B, it's R and S that are simultaneous with O. Good. Um, 
But that brings me finally to the conventionality thesis. After all, I'm not sure you noticed, but Einstein had to make one important assumption in his clock synchronization procedure. And that was the assumption that the speed of light is isotropic. That is the speed of light is the same in all spatial directions. And here in particular, it's the same in the AB direction and the BA direction. And here's the trouble, because in order to, to verify this assumption empirically, you would have to measure both one-way speeds of light and then compare them to, to one another to, to check that they're indeed equal. Uh, but now imagine you want to measure the one-way speed of light in the AB direction. The way to do so is just to take two clocks, a green clock and a blue clock, one at location A, the other at location B, and then you send the beam of light from A to B. You measure the point of departure with the green clock. You measure when the beam of light arrives at B with the, uh, the blue clock. And then you take the difference of those two times to know how long it took light to travel between A and B. You divide it by the distance between A and B and you get an expression for the speed of light in the AB direction. Uh, but, but so in order to measure this one-way speed of light, you need to have those two clocks, the green and the blue clock. And those have to be synchronized. And that's of course the whole problem because this is what we started with. How should one synchronize those two clocks? So as Einstein observed in 1916, it appears as if we are moving here in, in a logical circle. After all, if, if you want to measure the one-way speed of light, you first need to have two synchronized clocks. But in order to synchronize those two clocks, you need to know what the one-way speed of light is. And so it looks as if the only way out of this logical circle, or what Reichenbach called the velocity uh, simultaneity circle argument, the only way out of this is by breaking the circle as Einstein did in his 1905 paper, by simply assuming that the one-way speed of light is isotropic, and then using that assumption to define a notion of distance simultaneity. Now, Einstein was very well aware of this fact. Uh, he, he explicitly wrote, uh, we will establish by definition that the speed of light is isotropic. And he also called the title of, of that paragraph was called definition of distance simultaneity. So he was very well aware that this definition of simultaneity depended on this assumption and was therefore to be taken as a conventional notion and not a factual one. Now there's another way to arrive at this conventionality thesis and that is via the causal theory of time, which is actually Reichenbach's way uh, of arriving at the same thesis. Um, now, according to the causal theory of time, all temporal relations are reducible to causal relations. So take any two events, A and B. A is said to be earlier than B, even only if A is a potential cause of B, that is if A and B are somehow causally connected, where A is the cause and B is the effect. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Once you apply that to the synchronization procedure of Einstein, it actually leads to an interesting conclusion. So you, you notice here three important events, EA, EB, and EA prime. The light beam is, is sent from A at EA, it arrives at B at EB, uh, and is then sent back and re-arrives at A at EA prime. Um, now, if you want to look at the temporal order between EA and EB, you notice that those two events are linked via a light beam that is traveling between those two. So in a sense, EA is a potential cause of EB. Therefore, you can maintain that EA happened earlier than EB. Similarly for EB and EA prime, since those are connected via light beam as well, EB is a potential cause of EA prime. And so Reichenbach concludes, EB must happen before EA prime. But now comes the interesting thing. Now consider any other event E on the world line of A that is in this open interval between EA and EA prime. Um, and now let's try to, to, to look at what the temporal order is between E and EB. So in order to do so, you need to establish what the causal order is. You need to establish whether E is a cause or an effect of EB. Uh, but in order to be a cause or an effect, they have to be causally linked via some kind of causal chain, which I've represented here with this dotted line. And as you can see, 
in order for a causal signal to travel here between E and EB, that signal would have to travel at superluminal speeds, which is forbidden according to special relativity. And so this shows you that those two events here are not causally connectable. And since their causal order is left indeterminate, their temporal order as a consequence is also left indeterminate. So Reichenbach, on the basis of his causal theory of time, maintains that E is neither earlier than nor simultaneous with, nor even later than EB. That E is neither in the past, present, or future of EB because their temporal order is fully indeterminate. Uh, and this is not only the case for the, for the event E that I've shown here, it's actually the case for any event in this open interval between EA and EA prime. That is, if you were to draw a light cone on EB, you can see that any event in the absolute elsewhere of EB, so any event that is space-like separated from EB, um, is going to be uh, causally disconnected from EB, and so the temporal order for those events will remain indeterminate. Which implies that if you want to speak about the simultaneity of these distant events, you need to put in a definition of simultaneity by hand. Um, which is exactly what Einstein did. Yeah, so once again, here you see what Einstein did. Einstein just maintained that it's the event that is exactly midway between EA and EA prime that is simultaneous with EB, um, just leading to this kind of foliation of Minkowski spacetime and leading to the following expression for standard synchrony. But as, but as Reichenbach now clearly showed, you could have taken any other event in this interval as being the event simultaneous with EB. So you could have actually you could have introduced a very different way of, of synchronization, uh, a non-standard uh, synchronization method, where you replace this parameter a half by any other value between zero and one. Yeah. Call that epsilon, call that the Reichenbach synchronization parameter. So just to give you uh, one illustration, uh, suppose you didn't use epsilon is a half as in standard synchrony, but epsilon is one fourth, then TB would not equal two, but TB would equal one. And if you would connect that with the one o'clock at A, you see that you would actually foliate Minkowski space time differently. Um, and so your, your hyperplanes would now be slanted. And of course, that leads to two important uh, differences. For example, on the left, you can see that it takes light two units of time to travel from A to B, and another two units of time to travel back to A. So the speed of light is indeed the same in both directions. Uh, but on the right, it takes light only one unit of time to travel from A to B, but three units of time to travel back to A. So somehow the speed of light here, is uh, light is somehow traveling faster to the right than it travels to the left. Um, which is a perfectly uh, uh, okay uh, consequence of the conventionality of simultaneity. Now with that, I can move on to the, the second debate, uh, namely the debate on the reality of space-time. Uh, the problem here is that there, there's a, a whole variety of metaphysical positions about the nature of time on, on the market today. Uh, and so to keep the, the, the discussion focused, I'm, I'm going to only look at um, the debate between eternalism and presentism. Now, even presentism really is an umbrella term um, of various metaphysical positions. Um, for example, uh, different flavors of presentism can be distinguished um, depending on which spatial temporal shape the present is taking on. So on some accounts, uh, the present may be reduced to a single point, to a single space-time event, as in point presentism. Uh, but on other accounts, the present is taken to be bowtie or cone-shaped, as in bowtie presentism or cone presentism. Um, now, some of those flavors will be discussed further on, but uh, for the moment, I'm going to stick to what I think is the most standard uh, flavor of presentism, uh, which I've called hyperplane presentism, and where the present is taken to be this three-dimensional hyperplane of simultaneous events uh, that I've already shown a few times before. 
Now, let me unpack that position just a little more. So on this presentist account of time, the present is singled out as a uniquely special moment uh, that we call the now. And so only those events that constitute the present moment are taken to be real. So past events obviously were real in the past, but they're no longer real at the present moment. Uh, and future events will be real in the future, but are not yet real as of now at the present moment. So this implies that, that, the rea that, that reality is somehow reduced to what is happening presently. That is, reality is reduced to all those events that are simultaneous with the here and now. Or in other words, reality is this three-dimensional hypersurface of simultaneity. Uh, that is, the world is fundamentally three-dimensional, according to the hyperplane presentist. So to summarize, the presentist takes there to be an objective present. Uh, only present events are real. And typically, the presentist will also assume time to pass. So present events disappear into the past uh, as future events come into existence, leading to a succession of, of, of nows or, or some kind of moving now. Yeah. Uh, now, this dynamical aspect of time is called the passage of time or temporal becoming. And now contrast this presentist account with the eternalist outlook on time. So according to the eternalist, you should treat um, the temporal dimension on much the same footing as the three spatial dimensions. And so just as um, the Eiffel Tower in Paris is considered to be real, even though we can't see the Eiffel Tower because we're spatially removed from the Eiffel Tower by living here in Belgium, in much the same way, says the eternalist, uh, should we treat past and future events as real, even though we can't see them because they are temporally removed from us by living now anno 2021? Um, that is, not only present events are real, past and future events are equally real, according to the eternalist. And so uh, the world is a consequence doesn't only stretch out in the three spatial dimensions, but also in the temporal dimension, and is therefore fundamentally four-dimensional and not three-dimensional. Now, this account finds a natural representation in the so-called block universe, uh, where all events are somehow frozen in this four-dimensional block. Um, there's no objective present in the block universe, uh, as I said, past, present, and future events are all equally real. They're ontologically on a par. Uh, and finally, there's no obvious passage of time or temporal becoming in the block universe. But so notice that these fundamental differences between presentism and eternalism can actually be cashed out in terms of what events are taken to be real. According to the presentist, present events are real. For the eternalist, all events are real. But this, of course, leads to an interesting question. What does it actually mean to say that a particular space-time event is real? And, and actually, quite surprisingly, this question has remained largely untouched in the philosophical literature. Uh, I can only think of two exceptions worth mentioning. Uh, one is a paper by Craig Callender called Shedding Light on Time. The other one is a more recent paper by Peterson and Silberstein. I'll start with Calendar. So Calendar asks us to consider a manifold of space-time events where each event carries a light bulb that is either on or off, depending on whether that event is real or not real. So on that basis, the presentist will, cl will claim that only present lights are on, whereas the eternalist will, will maintain that all lights are on. And, and possibilism, as you can see, is really an intermediary position between presentism and eternalism, uh, according to which only past and present events are, uh, present lights are on, but the future lights are off. You know, possibilism here could, for example, be a, a growing block universe. Um, now, instead of associating a, a light bulb with each event, uh, Peterson and, and Silberstein introduced a reality field um, that denotes the ontic status of each space-time event 
by assigning it a so-called reality value or, or an R value for short, that is either one or zero, depending on whether that event is taken to be real or not real. Now, what is important about this is that the reality field is a scalar field. So that means that the reality value that it assigns to a particular space-time event is unique and observer independent. So all observers, irrespective of their frame of reference, will agree on the reality value that is assigned to a particular space-time point. Next, Peterson and Silberstein introduce a reality relation, R, that holds between any two events that share the same R value. So to give you a simple example, on the left, you see the manifold of space-time events. Take any two events, for example, A and B. Since both are assigned to the R value one, that is since both are taken to be real, the reality relation will, will hold between those two and you can say that A and B are equally real or that A is real for B. Now, due to the uniqueness of the R value for each and any event, um, the reality relation is also reflexive. That is, A is real for A since A has only one unique R value. Uh, the reality relation is also symmetric. If A is real for B, then B must also be real for A because A and B share the same R value. And finally, the reality relation is transitive. So if A is real for B and B is real for C, it follows that A must be real for C. Once again, A and B share the same R value, B and C share the same R value. So obviously A and C will also share the same R value. Now this of course turns the reality relation into an equivalence relation that is then able to partition the space-time manifold of events into two disjoint equivalence classes, uh, one class of real events and another class of unreal events. Now with this concept of, of, of reality values and, and reality relations, we can actually rewrite the presentist credo according to which all and only present events are real. So to do so, consider again a manifold of space-time events. Um, and let me also introduce the relation of distance simultaneity that holds between any two simultaneous events. Now imagine that B here represents our here and now. We are located at B at this very moment. Um, so obviously B is real for us. Now if A turned out to be simultaneous with B, then A was present for us at B, hence following the presentist credo, uh, A must be real for B. And so you get this very simple expression that somehow links um, the co-occurrence of two events with their coexistence. And with that, I can, I can introduce the Ritek Putnam argument. So you may have noticed when I presented presentism and eternalism, that presentism is, is much closer to our intuitions about time than eternalism. After all, we intuitively feel um, as if time is flowing uh, at a speed of one second per second on average. Um, it, it's flowing in one particular direction from the past to the future. Uh, we typically only take the present to be real. Yeah. Not many people believe that dinosaurs are still real or that super intelligent robots are already real. Uh, so all of this seems to be much closer to what the presentist is claiming than what the eternalist is saying. Uh, but with the advent of special relativity, these presentist intuitions were being challenged more and more. And so when you actually look at um, some surveys that are being done today, such as a survey um, on, on field papers, you can see that the majority of philosophers today have become eternalists and no longer presentists. Now, perhaps the most important uh, argument from special relativity for eternalism, for the four dimensionality of the world is this infamous Ritek Putnam argument uh, that was developed, as I said, independently by the Dutch physicist uh, Willem Ritek in 1966 and by the American philosopher Hilary Putnam in 1967. Now their argument is really a reductio ad absurdum. So uh, their, their aim is to, is to establish eternalism. 
but they do so by assuming the opposite thesis. So they, they assume presentism and then subsequently show the untenability of this position, uh, thereby refuting presentism and actually indirectly confirming eternalism. So here's how the argument runs. Um, what you see is a, is a Minkowski diagram, once again, uh, with two observers, uh, a green and a blue observer. The green observer is standing still. The blue observer is moving towards the green observer. Uh, now, since these two observers are in relative motion with one another, they will also draw their hyperplanes of simultaneity differently, horizontal for observer one, slightly slanted for observer two. Now, consider um, the two events A and B on the word line of observer one. And finally, there is a third event, event C, on the word line of observer two, that is space-like separated both from A and B. That's the setup. Now notice that event C is simultaneous with A according to the first observer's frame of reference. That is, C is present for observer one at, at, at A. And hence, following the presentist credo, C must be real for A. Similarly, you can see that B is simultaneous with C. That is, B is present for observer two at C. Hence, B must be real for C. And now using the transitivity of the reality relation that I introduced above, if B is real for C and C is real for A, it follows that B must be real for A. But notice that B is actually in the absolute future. It's in the future light cone of A. That is, B is definitely not um, present with A, it's, 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 it's in the future of A. B is not simultaneous with A. Hence, following the presentist credo, B is not real for A. And so we arrive at this contradictory conclusion that B is somehow both real and unreal for A. And so according to Rita and Putnam, the only way out of this contradiction is by rejecting the fourth premise according to which a future event is not real. And now, if you were to play this argument once again, by you could, you could of course move the second observer to the left and the right, and you could have it move at different speeds in different directions. And by doing so, you can actually uh, make any event uh, real. So any event in, in the future of A or in the past of A or even in the elsewhere of A will turn out to be real uh, based on this argument, which refutes presentism and actually confirms eternalism. All events are real. So Putnam in his paper writes, um, I conclude that um, the problem of the reality, I can't read it because my thing is in front of it. In any case, he concludes that um, the problem is solved. It's solved by physics and not by philosophy. Um, and so we've learned that we live in a four dimensional and not a three dimensional world. What's more, he believes that there are actually no longer any philosophical problems in time, which is a pretty bold claim to make in 1967. Um, but as I said, despite Putnam's confidence in his own argument, the Ritek Putnam argument has repeatedly come under fire uh, in, in the philosophy of special relativity. And so uh, various objections have been raised uh, against the argument, exposing different flaws and fallacies in the argument by Ritek and Putnam. Um, in my own doctoral dissertation, I, I distinguished no less than 11 objections to the Ritek Putnam argument. Yet surprisingly, the argument is still taken as one of the most important arguments in favor of eternalism. But so before moving to the very last part of my talk, uh, which is the conventionality objection to the Ritek Putnam argument that depends on the conventionality thesis, I wanted to very briefly show you the transitivity objection, uh, which is probably the most common objection to the Ritek Putnam argument. So, whereas Ritek Putnam um, rejected premise four, the transitivity objection actually takes issue with the third premise. That is, they take issue with the transitivity of the reality relation. After all, the, the, the idea is uh, in special relativity, the present is no longer absolute. The present has become a relative observer-dependent notion. Uh, what is present for me 
doesn't have to be present for you. And so if now the reality of events is tied up with their being present or not, clearly the reality is going to be relativized as well. Uh, and so you can see this actually quite clearly here. It's not because B is simultaneous with C and C is simultaneous with A that therefore B is simultaneous with A. This is, this is clear from, from the diagram. And so using the present is true though, that whenever two things are simultaneous, they're also real for one another. You see that from the non-transitivity of simultaneity, you just derive the non-transitivity of reality, contrary to what Rita Kaputnam were claiming. Or to put it even more explicit, the point is that in special relativity, the relation of distant simultaneity is no longer a binary relation between two events. It's actually a tertiary relation between two events seen from the point of view of a particular observer or from the point of view of a particular reference frame. Um, and so the mistake here in the Rita Quidem argument is that they, they took reality to be, they took the reality relation to be a binary relation and not a ternary relation. Now, I think the transitivity objection makes a lot of sense and is actually pretty convincing. Um, but notice that giving up on the transitivity of reality, of course, comes at a relatively high cost. Because if, if, if reality is, 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 a, is a relative notion, if, if what is real for me can be very different from what is real for you, it of course leads to, um, to a plurality of uh, observer-dependent realities. So in other words, if, if I were to meet another observer in my here and now, and we are in relative motion to one another, then not only will we disagree on what events, distant events are simultaneous, but we will also disagree on what is real. So you get a form of ontological pluralism, which to many philosophers is just one step too far. Now, Gallander calls this nonsense, uh, or at the very least a desperate move to try to refute the Vitek Putnam argument. Uh, but, but let me move on to the conventionality objection, uh, which is perhaps even simpler. So instead of um, rejecting the fourth or the third premise, the conventionality objection takes issue with the first two premises. Because remember, according to the conventionality thesis, the relation of distance simultaneity is a conventional one and not a factual one. That is for any two space-like separated events, their temporal order is left indeterminate because there is no causal connection possible between these two. And so, as you can see here, um, event C is space-like separated from A. Hence, there's no causal connection possible between those two events, and so their temporal order is left indeterminate. So you can't maintain that C is simultaneous with A as we did in the first premise. Similarly, B is space-like separated from C, so their temporal order is left indeterminate. And so once again, you can't simply maintain that B is simultaneous with C as in premise two. So both premises are false and that renders the whole argument unsound. Now, as I said, this, this, this type of objection has been raised by people like Weingart, Sklar and Deeks. Uh, and just by way of example, here's one quote by Sklar. Uh, he says, if we associate the real with the simultaneous, then accepting the convention of simultaneity, um, you also get a, a conventionist theory of reality for it. So it's only a matter of arbitrary stipulation that one distant event rather than another is taken as real for an observer. So that brings me to the very last part. What I want to do in, in this last part is to actually question this conclusion. I, I, want, to, I want to argue that in order to, to determine the strength of this conventionality objection, that one first is to decide whether the conventionality thesis is an ontic thesis or an epistemic one. And so on, on, on an ontic reading of the conventionality thesis, the relation of distance simultaneity is taken to be conventional as opposed to factual uh, because it doesn't exist in the objective world. There just isn't uh, a relation of distance simultaneity out there to be measured. Whereas on an epistemic reading, 
uh, the relation of distance simultaneity is conventional as opposed to factual, not because it doesn't exist, but because it is unverifiable. Um, so even, even if this relation were to exist, even if there was a fact of the matter as to whether two distant events are simultaneous or not, we fail to have epistemic access to that due to this velocity uh, simultaneity circle argument that I raised before. And so we're, we're somehow forced to treat this notion in a conventional manner because we fail to have epistemic access to that notion. Now, how does the conventionality objection to the Ritek Putnam argument fare on both of these readings? Yeah, now, let me start with the ontic reading. So, once again, here's Grunbaum actually subscribing to an ontic reading of the conventionality thesis. He says it's because no relations of distance simultaneity exist to be measured that measurement cannot disclose them. Now, I think on this reading, it's pretty obvious that if, if there's no such thing as distance simultaneity, then clearly the first two premises in the Ritek Putnam argument are without any substance. And so the conventionality objection certainly applies. That is, the Ritek Putnam argument doesn't go through. So perhaps not surprisingly, when you read the papers by Weingarts, Klar, and Deeks, you can see that at least implicitly, they seem to be assuming uh, or they seem to be adopting an, an ontic reading of the conventionality thesis. That seems to be what they have in their minds. Um, now, once again, even granting that an ontic reading of the conventionality thesis successfully undermines the Ritek Putnam argument, um, you can still ask where does it leave us uh, with respect to the presentism eternalism debate. Um, and, and here the consequences again can be pretty big. If, if you take distance simultaneity um, not to exist, if it's not part of the ontological furniture of the world, then if the present is constituted of all the events that are simultaneous with your here and now, but there's no such thing as distance simultaneity, the present is actually reduced to a single point, the here and now, to a single space-time point. And if, according to the presentist, only present events are real, then reality itself will be reduced to a single point, um, which, as Stein uh, said, is a peculiarly extreme but pluralistic form of solipsism. And again, you may wonder if you want to go all this way, um, just to reject any equipment argument. But as I said, there's also an epistemic reading possible of um, the conventionality thesis. And here it's worth distinguishing two further positions. So you have the agnostic who remains non-committal about the possible existence of distant simultaneity. Um, so it may exist, it may not exist. We actually don't know. And then you have what I will call the epsilon epistemicist. And she, on the other hand, is convinced that distant simultaneity really exists, uh, but that we fail to have epistemic access to it. So you could compare this position with, um, um, with any hidden variable interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, for example, in Bohmian mechanics, um, the hidden variables are the particle positions. So the idea is that every particle always has a definite position and thereby traces out a classical or semi-classical tra uh, trajectory. Uh, but we fail to have epistemic access to those particle positions. And so we are forced to treat them as hidden variables. So in the same way, the idea here is that there may be such a thing as distant simultaneity. There may be a fact of the matter as to which two events are simultaneous with one another. Um, but since we fail to have epistemic access to it, we're forced to treat this notion in a conventional way. Um, but the fact remains that, that the epsilon synchronization parameter actually has a determined value on this, um, on this account. So just to recall, if epsilon um, equals a half, we have standard synchrony and all the hyperplanes are orthogonal to uh, the word line of the observer. If epsilon were to have any different value, you would get a different foliation of Minkowski space-time. Yeah. So, so how would the Putnam argument now fare uh, on this epsilon epistemicist interpretation of the conventionality thesis? Notice that Ritek and Putnam actually implicitly assumed epsilon to be 
equal to a half. That is, they applied standard synchrony, and that's why the hyperplanes of simultaneity here are orthogonal to the world lines. But now imagine that it so happens that we live in a world where epsilon is not equal to a half, but is actually one fourth. In that case, Minkowski space time would no longer be foliated in hyperplanes of simultaneity, but actually in one sheeted hypercones, uh, which, is, which is quite odd. But despite this fact, the relativity of simultaneity still holds, and you can see that the Ritek Putnam argument actually goes through unaffected. Um, now, most philosophers and physicists don't really like um, this notion of, of, of hypercones of simultaneity um, because it, it, it turns the notion of distant simultaneity into something that is non-symmetric and non-transitive. Uh, I think you can actually see this quite clearly on the diagram here. Uh, you can see that C is simultaneous with A because C is on the hypercone of A, but A is not simultaneous with C because A is not on the hypercone of C. Um, and so that's quite odd. So one way to restore symmetry and transitivity is by making epsilon direction dependent, which is actually often done in the literature. The idea is that if epsilon has the value one fourth to the right, it should have a value of three fourths to the left. And by making epsilon in that, in that way direction dependent, you, you, you will no longer have a foliation to hyper cones, but a foliation to hyper planes. The hyper planes will still not be orthogonal with the word line as in standard synchrony, it will be slanted, but at least you get a hyperplane. And so you get a notion of simultaneity that is symmetric and transitive. And once again, I think even on, on, on this um, account with a direction dependent epsilon, you can pretty clearly see that the Dirichlet Putnam argument still goes through unaffected. But of course, and finally, if, if, if I can make epsilon direction dependent, why couldn't I make it observer dependent? I could argue that epsilon actually depends on um, the, the, the state of motion of the observer. For example, here you can see that for observer one, I've taken epsilon to be equal to a half standard synchrony. That's why uh, its hyperplane of simultaneity is orthogonal to the world line. But for observer two, who's in a different state of motion, I've taken a different value of epsilon such that her hyperplane of simultaneity co coincides with his plane of simultaneity. And so by, by making epsilon observer dependent, I, I can actually reintroduce a notion of absolute simultaneity in special relativity. So, so any neo-Lorentzian interpretation of special relativity, for example, would be very happy to do something like this. Uh, and even in Bohmian mechanics, for example, uh, where they get into a, lot, in, into a lot of trouble because of non-local correlations between distant events, it has been argued that we may have to reintroduce a preferred foliation of Minkowski spacetime much along the lines presented here. But of course, once you reintroduce an absolute notion of simultaneity, the Ritek Putnam argument will fail to go through. So to summarize, whereas Weingart, Deeks, uh, and S. Clark were claiming that the conventionality thesis of distant simultaneity undermines the Ritek Putnam argument, I hope to have shown you that the, the, the situation is actually more subtle than that and, and depends first and foremost on whether this thesis is taken to be an ontic or an epistemic one. And so I grant that on an ontic reading, it successfully undermines the Nitek Putnam argument, but on an epistemic reading of this thesis, you can still go many ways. And on many of those ways, the Nitek Putnam argument goes through without any problem. So to conclude, um, I've argued that the way in which the conventionality thesis impacts the Ritek Putnam argument depends on uh, whether the conventionality thesis is an ontic or an epistemic one. Uh, perhaps more importantly, I hope to have shown you that the soundness of the Ritek Putnam argument um, hinges on our interpretation of reality, and in particular on, on the alleged transitivity of this reality relation and its intimate link with simultaneity. Now, I think it's pretty clear that the reality relation doesn't belong to the formalism of special relativity. There's no textbook of special relativity that talks of the reality of events. And as such, the, the special relativity alone leaves the debate between presentism and, and eternalism underdetermined. Uh, that is, 
physics at most constrains our metaphysics, but it can't settle it. So, so any metaphysical inquiry into the nature of time will actually quickly outrun the scope of physics. I think, I think your metaphysics will always remain within the straitjacket of physics, but physics alone will never be able to settle any of those metaphysical debates. Uh, and I think this actually beautifully resonates with um, uh, a quote by David Lewis, and I'll end with that one. Uh, he said that a, a reasonable goal for a philosopher, well, I can't, again, I can't read it, so I'll let you read it. In any case, you need to be looking for equilibria. So presentism may be one equilibrium, eternalism may be another equilibrium that can withstand uh, further examination, but it's going to be very difficult to settle for one or the other uh, by purely empirical or physical means. Thank you very much. Thank you.